Hello. Hello. Hi, Ritush. We'll go live. Yeah, already live. Okay. Uh, Hi everyone, uh, wish you a happy 2021 and thank you for joining us on this Sunday evening. I'm your host Srikant and welcome to Cashless Consumers Payment Deep Dives, a series of sessions on real world practice of digital payments. In today's session, uh, we'll be looking at killer apps detecting predatory fintech apps. Uh, to provide a brief context, you may have uh, read in the news about app based loans, uh, suicides, and arrests by various police agencies. Uh, cashless consumer along with uh, ban breach did a broader study on the larger ecosystem of digital lending uh, more specifically on the rogue fintech apps and in today's session uh, we'll be sharing our findings and thinking aloud on possible solution to these uh, killer loan apps uh, joining us today for the session is suman kar uh, ceo of brand beach uh, ban breach a cyber security company working on securing individuals and organizations in an increasingly hostile world through a combination of network security products and services. Suman and myself will be jointly presenting uh, over the next 45 minutes and uh, we'll have a Q&A followed by it. Uh, please post your questions on the Zoom Q&A or on the YouTube chat. We'll, um, we'll have them answered at the end. Uh, over to you, Suman. All right. Thanks a ton, Srikant. And thank you, a big thank you to Hasgeek and everyone there for you know letting us do this. Um, and I'm really excited to share uh, our little research that we've done. Uh, before we go there, I just wanted to say hi, I'm Shimon Kaur. I started Bandridge back in 2016 and the idea was to change the way cybersecurity is practiced in India and uh, you know make it more India focused and solve problems that we face here in India. And I think uh, our current work is very much in line with our vision as a company. Okay. Right. So what I'll do is I'll just share my screen or I'll share a presentation that we've cooked up to make things easy. And by the way, uh, Srikant, should we just wait for a couple more minutes for other people to join in? Hello. Yeah, just give me a minute. I'm just checking the YouTube stream if that's okay. up and then sure. No, I was just saying if we should, you know, uh, wait for a couple more minutes because I think we have uh, only two people. Yeah, here. I think there are good folks waiting in YouTube, so I think we can get started. Uh, ah, okay. Okay. Suman, you can get started. Sure. Okay. So our YouTube is up. Yep. Yep. All right. Okay. All right. So hello and welcome to our presentation on killer loan apps. 
I have with me a series of slides uh, that I'll be walking you through and we'll explore uh, whatever uh, we found so far purely from open source intelligence. All right. But before we start, I think uh, maybe uh, Srikanth, you, you, would you like to you know, share a couple of words or about cashless consumer and what you're doing with it? Yeah, sure. So, yeah. Uh, so, uh, for those of you joining us for the first time, uh, Cashless Consumer is a consumer collective focusing on uh, digital payments, uh, looking through awareness, uh, technology, data, and policy uh, surrounding uh, digital payments uh, to move towards a fair cashless society. Uh, so, as part of our research, we've been looking at uh, payment uh, technologies for a while, and uh, in, as an extension to that, we've been uh, studying these fintech uh, apps on lending as well. Uh, so uh, we're an open community. Feel free to join us on Telegram. Uh, and we keep chatting on all things payments from a consumer perspective. Uh, yes, Sumit. Thanks, Srikant. And uh, please do join him. He's done some excellent work, not just on killer loan apps, but also a lot on the digital, uh, I mean, digital payments landscape here in India. And uh, we, we, uh, we at Bandridge, we work mostly on security. So there is a lot of overlap there with what Srikant does. And apart from security, we also work on privacy and anonymity. We, we have products uh, that are geared towards uh, securing both individuals as well as organizations and we do consulting for organizations especially data breach consulting and uh, that i guess is a short and good enough intro and i'll just get started with the presentation all right okay so our target audience for this presentation would be mostly anyone who is interested in the fintech landscape in india anyone who's working on OSINT as well as you know, engineers and product managers. We also hope that bankers and law enforcement executives will watch our presentation at some point of time, and uh, you know, we'll have been able to provide them with valuable insights. So we've seen. Uh, Suman, so, so yeah. sorry, sorry, so your uh, slides are stuck. So if you're not. Oh, okay. Slides, yeah. then... Right. Can you see them now? Yeah. 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 All yeah. right. Thanks. Okay. All right, so we also hope uh, the journalists will chime in and uh, who've, especially the ones who've been covering the fintech frauds. And we've uh, had some conversations with them and we think uh, that there's a lot to explore for both uh, for both journalists as well as us. And you know, this is just the beginning. And finally, we, I think this would be a very interesting presentation for anyone who's starting uh, out in you know exploring app based lending or app based microfinance as well as how credit scoring authentication kyc and uh, even you know the cash flows through this ecosystem right and finally uh, i think uh, if you are uh, an open source enthusiast you should probably also watch this because we we need your help because we, when we are trying to build a supervisory tech for apps, uh, it's not something that we can do it by ourselves. So please watch this and you know let us know how you can help. All right, and uh, so, so shout out to some uh, really helpful people on Twitter who you know pointed us out in the right direction or even you know shared very good intel with us. We'd also like to thank journalists for covering this on a national level. And there's some fantastic OSINT platforms that have helped us do that. Creative Wolf uh, has really, you know, as I, I, I mean, he's been fantastic. He's been awesome, actually. He's been juggling uh, work for 14 hours and then, you know, putting in, burning the midnight oil with us. And of course, a uh, huge thank you to Hasgeek for. Uh, setting this up. All right. And 
and before we actually go into the research bit, I just wanted to make sure that we understand that this is not a complete work. This is something that we are working on actively, even as we speak. So this is uh, this is a rough cut, rough first uh, version sort of, and uh, we've not yet uh, covered every single company or app that is that exists there in this ecosystem, and we've not yet uh, covered, uh, you know, how these apps or companies or individuals are linked with each other. And, but we do hope to cover this in over the next couple of months, at least. All right. So, uh, I mean, before we get into how to spot a loan app, uh, Srikant, do you want to spare a moment and explain uh, the app based lend lending thing? So, uh... Yes, sir. Uh, so broadly, uh, we are focused on say digital lending, and uh, even within that, a narrow segment of uh, instant personal loans. Uh, so while say digital lending would uh, cover a broader set of uh, loan applications and use of uh, digital tools for lending, uh, here we'd be restricting ourselves to the instant loan apps. So these are apps on. Uh, which people can download and install, and uh, which also provide them instant uh, personal loan, uh, often with uh, no collateral. Uh, and these are for uh, for people with new to credit and uh, who may not have a formal financial profile, uh, credit score, and so on. Uh, yes, sir. Right. Thanks. And uh, so. Let's say you need money and you don't really have friends. You you know you're in sudden uh, need and you don't have friends who can probably you know lend you two thousand or three thousand bucks uh, off the bat. And so what do you do? Uh, because we have a smartphone and we have almost free internet. I think the most natural reaction for us is to go on to Play Store and see if there is an app for that. The Play Store being the uh, ever helpful tool that it is, you know, the moment you start typing in, it'll give you like 50 different suggestions on, you know, how to look up loan apps. And, you know, I have some of these such suggestions here on the screen, you know, essentially, and that also gives you an idea of how, what people are searching for. So people are essentially looking for loans without salary slips or they want approval in five minutes. So the expectation is that people want uh, low collateral or collateral free loans instantly, okay? And when you look for that, you are going to find hundreds and hundreds of apps, right? And it's uh, overwhelming when you first start out looking at these apps. So, so not only, and, the biggest challenge then is to you know find an app that you can trust and that you you know it's going to solve your problem and this is where it becomes very tricky because most of these apps they have a very standard look and feel if you go on to the app page you'll see that they have a, a semi decent logo they will have a semi decent uh, screen uh, you know, mock up screen mock ups on the app description page. And, you know, you'll, you'll probably also see that that app has been downloaded 50,000 or 100,000 times. And uh, you'd see rave reviews as well. So, so, you know, you'll probably feel very, very comfortable about downloading that app. And that's where people actually go wrong. Because if you scroll down and, you know, if you look at the additional information section, that's where things start getting in interesting. For example, most of the apps that have been abusing users' trust or, you know, who've been, who've driven, the apps that have driven people to suicide, they're very, very shady. And when you go down to the additional information section, you'd probably see that they don't even have a privacy policy. They, they probably use a generic Gmail address for, consumer complaints 
and uh, they, they probably also not have a website. The app that we have here on, on this screenshot is an exception. Why? Because it has a, a privacy policy, it has a website. Okay. And uh, Srikanth is going to tell you more about, you know, the statistics on that for the entire universe of apps that he's seen. But uh, so this is the first red flag. Okay. The second red flag that you should look for is what are people saying about this app? So you should go to the reviews page and sort by newest and then start looking at and start reading at least the, you know, last 20 or last 30 comments. There are two kinds of comments usually. Uh, you'd see that, you know, people have mostly trashed the product or you'd see people have given it a five star review. Now, if you look at the five star reviews, they, are, they look like uh, they're from bot accounts, okay? And uh, while we don't have a complete picture on the bot ecosystem, but uh, what you can use to, you know, figure out if it's a bot or not is, you know, you can look at the text. So, you know, if it's a genuine customer, he or she will probably have put in a proper sentence or even a paragraph, right? Explaining what he or she liked about the app or what he or she didn't like about the app. On the other hand, these uh, bot-based reviews, they are very, very short usually. You know, and most of them give it a five, uh, five out of five star. And uh, they'll just, you know, say two or three words, like it's a very easy process or, you know, it's a fantastic app. That's about it. Now, once you go through these reviews, you're going to see that, you know, uh, there's a, I mean, uh, most reviews, most of the user reviews are very, very negative and people will actually start complaining about how they've either not gotten a loan or, you know, uh, they might have gotten a loan, but they've not been able to repay on time and uh, which has led in, led them to accrue further interest. And another important aspect of the reviews is that you would never see anyone from the app company interacting with users. So the users are mostly left uh, helpless, okay? So they have no one to complain or they have no recourse. There's another interesting thing that we looked at, uh, that we found actually when we were looking at these apps. And that was uh, how the reviews are distributed. So if you, this one, this particular app that we have here is an exception. But for most apps that we looked at, the reviews were extremely skewed. You would have uh, you know, you would have 50,000 downloads and around five to 10,000 five star ratings and probably 500 to, you know, uh, one star ratings from irate customers and nothing in between. Now, when you don't have any reviews in two, three, or four star range, it's another huge red flag. Okay. So you probably shouldn't be downloading that app. All right. Now, if you actually Take the trouble of visiting the website that's linked to the additional information page you would see that it's a very generic low information website and you know if you look up who this uh, who's who owns the domain of this for this particular website you'd probably find an entity sitting in china so what happens here is essentially you know you have apps developed in china as well as you know, websites uh, linked to those apps developed by some Chinese organization or actor, and you just have the operations here in India. Okay, uh, Srikant, anything? I mean, would you like to pitch in? Or do you think I'm right or wrong? Yeah, we are good. good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, we did. Uh, we actually. Uh, looked a little deeper and what we did was we looked at the source code of this we tried to analyze the source code of these apps as well a uh, few things stand out immediately once you start analy analyzing the source code one these apps ask for 
any number of permissions and and i mean it, and it it's mind boggling you know i mean it's very hard to justify why an app that you know helps you borrow money would want to kill background processes okay or why they would want to you know uh access your network state for example or flashlight <laughs> absolutely and once you actually start reading the reviews or you know start reading the news reports you'll figure out why they need these app, these permissions it's because uh you know they are using your personal information as a form of collateral and in order to retrieve that sort of information uh they need uh these uh, very very wide very broad permissions okay the other thing that we can figure out from the source analysis uh are the players who actually allow these apps to work for example you know you can figure out what sort of payment processor uh, the app is using or what sort of kyc provider they are using for example this app this particular app that you have on the screen they are using uh, uh an api or sdk an sdk is nothing but a software library uh, that serves a particular purpose so for example this app uses uh, an api from advance ai it's a chinese company working on ai driven ekyc so this app basically then you know takes your picture sends it back to a server in china does uh, a test for and basically you know checks it whether you know you're a, you're a real individual and then uh, you know passes in other metadata information back to the app then uh, this app also uses uh, cash free for payment processing and and it and you can also figure out that they use a number of third party tools for uh for displaying pictures and grabbing uh, media from your phone okay so overall you'd see that uh, any of the any loan app uh, any rogue loan app uh most of their code is about payment processing it's about uh, kyc and it's also about retrieving data from your phone okay and shrikant is going to talk about this in detail in a bit all right okay and this another thing another very interesting thing that we found that was uh, these apps actually go all out when it comes to app store optimization so you know uh, they would have about you know 10 12 keywords stuffed into the name of the apk so that you know uh, it uh, scores better and you know it's uh, they, these apps come up higher when you're looking to uh, looking for a looking for an app to borrow money from okay and uh, you know using uh, so many keywords uh, in the name of an app is actually uh, something that we've not seen very frequently so that's another indicator that you know the app is probably uh, not legit okay all right so before we go further srikant would you just uh, walk through the digital lending scene in india yeah uh, so uh, broadly uh, digital lending covers as i mentioned before a broader set of uh, use of digital technologies for lending uh, and this includes a peer to peer lending which is uh, again done by a set of nbfcs uh, but slightly at a larger scale for high value uh, loans and then there is uh, okay that is coming for business uh, lending based on say gst and so on and then there are retail consumer loans so these are basically the instant loan apps uh, which people can download and uh they often do an uh, online kyc and then uh, service new to credit customers so typically people who don't have a credit score with uh, sibil and so on and they have an end to end digitization of lending 
and on the next slide uh, so at a very high level uh, if you compare uh, the, the offline lending or the previous mode of lending uh, by banks and nbfcs uh, and digital lending in the, in the case of offline lending you will have actually agents who will be sourcing uh, leads uh, so who will be this will be telecallers uh, this will be people who say put pamphlets and then source leads whereas in the case of digital lending you will uh, increasingly find uh, online ads are like key drivers so you will have online ads on say platforms like youtube uh, or even say uh, google ads and so on uh, or any of the even uh, ads on your uh, phone uh, so if you have probably some game app uh, that will probably have an ad as well and uh, the uh, offline lending used to have a paper based uh, flow where you need to fill up a form and it will have an uh, approval cycle uh, done offline as against in the digital lending world you will have uh, an online application and an instant approval uh, so in the offline world you will again have some kind of a credit bureau check uh, in the digital world as well you will have the credit bureau check uh, in addition to it, you'll also have uh, alternate credit risk providers, particularly for the new to credit customers. Uh, again, in the offline world, you will have uh, typically will be made to open a new account and uh, it, or otherwise it will be dispersed via a check. Whereas in the case of digital lending, uh, you will get the money instantly using IMPS most likely, uh, or in some cases, you'll also have a credit card that is sanctioned a limit. Uh, when it comes to collections uh, in the offline world it's again either predominantly cash or check whereas in, in the digital lending scene uh, it's mostly done through cards upi and, and in some cases enash um, another comparison on the recovery tactics uh, in case of uh, default borrowers uh, is that in the case of offline lending, you will have strong arm recovery tactics, so like people coming to your home and so on. Uh, in the online, uh, that has an equivalent uh, in the form of cyberbullying and social shaming. So these are uh, the WhatsApp groups that get created uh, and uh, the picture of the person uh, will be put in that group and all that person's contact will be in that WhatsApp group. So that's a form of social shaming. And we've seen that this is like predominantly predominant driver uh, in most of these suicides that have happened. Right. And uh, so why are people driven to suicides? And I think this is uh, something that she can't do remember. You, talk, uh, you told me about this, that, you know, how people actually end up with 20 or 30 different such apps on their phone. Right. right. So. And, you know, when we started looking into it, what we figured out was that, you know, there's always this gap in the amount of money uh, that an individual needs and what the platform provides. The first, first, uh, first hurdle for someone who's looking to borrow via one of these uh, lo uh, loan or lending apps is that, you know, when they need about 10,000 rupees, they'll probably uh, get a loan sanctioned for only two or 3,000 rupees, right? So that's the first problem. Now, if, even when, uh, you know, a 2,000 rupees loan is sanctioned, the individual doesn't really get 2,000 rupees. What they get is 2,000 rupees, uh, something less than 2,000 rupees. And uh, they get less because there's a processing fee usually 14 or 15 percent of the loan amount that's deducted already okay so what the individual at so when when an individual actually gets a loan what he or she really gets is uh the interest for the amount he originally wanted to borrow and then an uh, amount uh, which is slightly uh, less than what he wanted okay so for example if he wanted to borrow 2000 rupees he would actually have to pay a processing fee of uh, 280 rupees and uh, you know for a 15 day loan and uh, he would get uh, 1720 rupees in hand but when it comes to paying back he'll have to pay back 2000 rupees as well as 
uh, a 30 rupees interest that he'll be charged for 15 days. Now this is assuming that he is able to pay within the tenure that the app has scheduled for him. What happens in most cases is A, the app's payment gateways do not work when people actually try to pay on time, which means they fail and they start accruing interest, which is usually at twice the interest rate that they are charged when they borrowed in the first place. Okay. The other thing is, of course, you know, if you need, uh, you know, 5,000 rupees, you get a loan of 2,000 rupees only, uh, you'll probably have trouble uh, making ends meet. So anyway, you know, you might actually also end up uh, having trouble repaying the loan after 15 days. In either case, what happens is then uh, that individual fails, when, he, when that in, individual fails to pay, he or she usually gets a call from the uh, lending app. And they will tr uh, try strong arm tactics and they will also suggest that, you know, they, they download another app and take, uh, I'll take a loan, a second loan from that app and pay the first app back. People actually do that. And what they end up with then is they have, they take a loan for the originally original principal and interest from the second app, they pay back the first app and then they are now stuck in a debt trap with the second app. Now, when time comes for repaying the second uh, loan, they, they, they again face the same problem with payment providers not working, payment gateways failing. So, you know, they start accruing interest, they, then they go move on to a third app and so on and so forth. So what really happens after, you know, let's say, you know, two or three months is that uh, they end up, they rake, they rake up like a huge interest rate, a huge interest, huge amount of interest, which would be at least, you know, five or six times what they had originally wanted to borrow. And that, that sort of debt burden is driving people to suicide, especially uh, during COVID when we, we, you know, when the economy was not doing great, people lost jobs, uh, I think, uh, this loan and uh, this debt burden became way too much for a lot of people. Okay. Now, it won't be fair to say that uh, COVID excess, you know, COVID basically caused this loan scam to explode. What we found when we started digging in was that this has been going on for at least, uh, you know, two to three years. In fact, YouTube hashtags are a fantastic way to trace this history. You know? So, you know, one of the earliest hashtags that we were able to attribute to this sort of operation or this sort of an online loan, uh, app-based online loans uh, was personal loan. And if you look at, uh, you know, if you look that particular hashtag up on YouTube, you'd see that, you know, there are ads or, you know, presentations made which go back to 2018 and you know those are mostly ads and they encourage people to you know download an app provide a basic uh, identity proof of identity like Aadhaar or pan card and uh, you know and then uh, basically apply for loans and this must have worked for a while because we don't really see too many complaints at that point of time now and this went on for 28, you know, throughout 2018 and then into 2019. And, you know, and then what happened was that, you know, when more and more, as more and more people started downloading these apps and taking loans, you know, uh, people started uh, defaulting. And as soon as people started defaulting, uh, the, these loan, these lending companies started uh, employing st strong arm tactics. Okay. They started calling contacts up and you know then people started uh, and consumers also started uh, waking up and that's when they started uploading their complaints on youtube against such apps and their strong arm tactics all right and you can trace that through the instant loan fraud hashtag okay 
and this was going on till about you know uh, jan uh, january or even you know the first quarter of 2020 and thereafter what happened was the national lack, national lockdown due to covid and suddenly there was this uh, huge uh, huge gap in what people were earning because a lot of people lost jobs or you know suddenly they they started they, they their earnings went down but their expenses didn't and you know so naturally they started turning in droves he started turning to these apps in droves okay and uh, you know and then it was then that the problem actually exploded in fact, it went. Uh, in, in fact, in fact, these problems or these complaints went viral, and national media channels started covering them. And you can see that by looking up uh, the Operation Hafta Vasuli hashtag on YouTube. Okay. Now, while YouTube provides us uh, with a picture of what the apps were doing to attract customers and what the customers were trying to you know fight back uh, that we also see that these apps were present on other social media platforms like tiktok and facebook okay and i we have a screenshot of an uh, you know often of a video on tiktok okay and this is for an app called cashbean okay and Cashmin, if you don't know, is uh, an app by PC Financials, which is essentially an India finance operations of Opera. And by Opera, we mean the uh, browser. Okay. If you don't know, uh, Opera has been actually uh, getting into uh, markets like Kenya, Nigeria, and India, and flooding uh, the app stores with loan apps and you know uh, basically exploiting the p2p lending uh, basically exploiting the gap in the p2p lending industry there okay but more on uh, opera later we'll just move on to the breadth of operations so once these uh, once the operations 20 we see that uh, you know we can and we can see that by looking at the number of related companies that have come up here's uh, you know and we have here essentially the number of companies that we were able to link to uh, one or more of the apps that we uh, we have and we see that you know things were relatively quiet up to 2017 and then in 2018 and 2019, there was a major push, and that that also coincided with the fact that you know India was also pushing digitization and digital economy a lot at that point of time. So we see a lot of players come up uh, during that time, and then in 2020, things just you know uh, go astronomical. Okay, and uh, while uh, we we see you know a lion's share of these companies come up in bangalore uh, we see that uh, we can all, we see that some of uh, or you know we see companies coming up in most of the other major metro towns as well okay two cities have been missing actually from operations and it's been a surprise for us uh, one is definitely mumbai and the other is kolkata both of these cities actually register a ton of companies every month and do not find any of the app based uh, lending companies come up in mumbai which is the financial capital or even calcutta which is you know a gateway to the northeast is surprising okay and more on the app stuff from Shikant. Yeah, so uh, we analyzed a, series, a dump of 1,000 apps, uh, of which around 700 to 750 were available on Play Store. Uh, 
so on what was there on play store we were able to further analyze the play store metadata so what uh, suman showed up on the first screen so in in the play store data we only found that only 300 odd apps actually had a website uh, so the remaining didn't have a website and in play store uh, there is also a, a physical address that's present and only 90 of these apps had a physical address and and here it's not even a legitimate address it could be something like even like bangalore india uh, so only 90 of these apps even had uh, something mentioned in the physical address uh, i mean this is another proxy indicator to detect if an app is uh, real or, or fake so one easy way is to check the address and then uh, if you have some doubt or want to double check uh, take that address and uh, search out on google maps uh, you would probably see if there is a company uh, or if there is a uh, there's a by lane uh, a gully in which uh, some uh, somebody has put a boat so you you know the difference whether it's an actual company in a city or uh, in some by lane in some city uh, on the so there were 300 other apps uh, which are either part of the google play store or uh, were never uploaded into play store uh, so we don't know whether they were in play store and didn't got deleted or they never made it to play store uh, but there are again 300 other apps uh, on that uh, let me just a second oops sorry so i just lost the presentation do you want me to reshare yeah no okay yeah uh, so uh, on one thing one other thing that we found was uh, among these 1000 apps uh, 600 of them at least used uh, some kind of uh, liveness detection uh, or or they took the selfie and then they ran it across an ai uh, so while uh, this might seem like a very non trivial thing this also has a great uh, concern on national security because uh, what this piece of code is does it it, it also collects uh, the facial recognition uh worth the image along with the personal details of the individual so practically uh it has the potential to say mirror the other database if the person also used say uh, provided other uh, while applying for this loan and uh, these entities so then collect uh, have faces and then the id proofs and, and so on so which could essentially mean they could build a parallel other system uh and this needs to be like uh studied in depth as to what kind of uh, data they are storing and and how they are processing and also 85% of these apps were broadly white label based uh so by that i mean these were apps that were uh, deployed out of the same template so there's probably one company that makes a white label app uh, and then the individual uh companies that brand themselves as whatever apps they want to uh do their branding and then release the app uh, but the app functionality uh in in terms of the uh, technology backend remains the same uh so by and large th there are we found uh, three to four white label providers uh on whom a lot of these apps were based on so that's also the reason why most of these apps were like so similar uh, to each other right and uh, so and the apps 
it's not just uh, that the apps are similar, right? We also found that there's a uh, huge uh, amount of overlap in the directorships that these companies have. So when we started looking, uh, when we started looking at the apps, we also tried to map which registered company each individual app belonged to. And then we started looking at the directors of those companies. And as uh, we went uh, along that road, what we found was that uh, the same names kept coming up across different companies. Okay, And it's not just the names uh, of individuals that came up repeatedly, but we saw that you know the same address come up against 30, 40 apps in one case, or we would see the same email address that has come up against you know companies that have been registered in four different cities. All right. Now, that's the uh, Indian human resource part of the companies. But what these uh, app companies also share in common is that uh, they have at least one or two directors whose names appear to be Chinese at this point of time. And uh, in fact, what we saw was uh, there would be one Indian individual who would share directorship with multiple individuals with names that appear to be Chinese. And, uh, and we see this pattern repeated across cities, okay, especially in the companies that have come up between 2019 and 2020. And what surprised us was the fact that in spite of the travel ban, in spite of the lockdown, the speed at which companies kept getting created uh, did not go down. And uh, all right. All right, so apart from uh, individuals, uh, we also wanted to take a look at what all services these apps, you, you know, what all services these apps use. And I think uh, Srikanth has uh, some insight into this. Srikanth, would you like to? Yeah, so uh, broadly, uh, everyone knows that say, uh, they use WhatsApp to do uh, recovery or the social shaming and so on. So that's the obvious part of it and uh, the next obvious part is also that some of these apps have a payment processor uh, so we uh, we do have uh, so here again there is a distinction there are apps without any kind of payment integration and uh, possibly the both the disbursements as well as the uh, collections happen uh, using individuals uh, gpay account or paytm or upi uh, in which case the app will not have any payment processor in it. But we did find good amount of apps uh, having either Razor Pay, Cash Free, or PayU uh, integrated into them. Uh, so that's the payment. So the, these apps do use payment processors, which means that they actually use, say, a, a bank account that has a PAN uh, to it. And this is also the reason why say they form so many companies. So for each company, they would get a pan uh, for that company and then they would probably be able to open a bank account and to which uh, they could uh, get payments via these payment processors. And uh, aside from that, uh, the next obvious uh, thing would be the EKYC provider. So uh, EKYC post COVID has also been largely focused on video KYC, which means that you take uh, a selfie video or a selfie and, and then upload uh, on the app. Uh, and for these, they use uh, uh, by and large two providers. So one is Hyperverge. Uh, this is an Indian uh, startup providing uh, KYC services. And then the other company is Advanced AI. Uh, this is the, uh, this looks like again, a uh, a Chinese startup based out of Singapore, uh, which has operations in six countries. And both of these apps collect uh, the selfies uh, and then use 
does a deduplication of that uh, over its database so that uh, they know that uh, whether you have gotten a loan from another app and so on and with which they build again your credit profile uh, tied to your face uh, and in one sense you can actually say this uh, they are actually also building a facial id database at a multi country scale i mean because they're not uh, operating in just one country but uh, typically their operations span across india vietnam thailand uh, uh, indonesia uh, and uh, in some cases mexico and nigeria uh, but largely the facial id providers have largely focused uh, either remained uh, in asia uh, probably because to tune their models to asian faces which follow a pattern uh, and and then uh, some of them also use uh, alibaba the chinese cloud service provider uh, although the uh, indian apps typically use say amazon aws or uh, azure or google uh, cloud platform uh, the chinese apps use the alibaba cloud uh, uh, as their cloud backend uh and then comes uh ad brokers so these are uh, basically drivers to get the app installed so while they these apps are listed on play store and depend on play store for installation uh not that's not their primary source of uh, app installation they do depend on ad brokers who kind of uh, show up ads uh, to users who are more likely to install these apps and there are these uh, multiple ad brokers who use uh, the gambling apps or youtube to push in uh, uh, ads uh, and then there are uh, analytics providers who basically uh, do their bit uh, in analyzing all your sms uh, or in some cases including your say uh, contacts and, and call registries to kind of give you a credit score or an alternate score uh, and here again we have hyperverge advanced ai think think 360 as uh, providers uh, and moving on we have like uh, white label providers so as i was mentioning that uh, a large section of these apps were kind of generated by white label providers so we found uh, like at least three entities uh, pytixi uh, epoch and fintopia fintopia uh, interestingly is registered in bangalore uh, but again uh, is a pan asian uh, fintech as a service white label provider uh, whereas uh, pytixi and epoch are headquartered out of china and so all these three entities basically are like uh, shops where uh, anyone can go and and mm -hmm. buy uh, like give me a fintech app or uh, give me a loan app plus the loan backend or give me all technology that's needed for me to run a loan app uh, so where you can just go and shop uh, the technology required to run operations uh, for these learning apps and then they of course use uh, uh, all these apps use wide range of permissions on android to kind of source data and uh, it, what's interesting to note that is uh, while they source data after you install any of these apps uh, they also use data brokers uh, who have embedded themselves into some of the other apps so even if you don't have a loan app today on your phone uh, depending on the app that you have uh, that could be seemingly unharmful let's say a, a gaming app for say a bubble shooter or your something that your kid plays uh, but it might also be collecting the same amount of data and sending it to data brokers uh, who would then share that to say the analytics providers and, and the white labels to provide uh, convert that data into risk models and credit models so these are again some of the uh, technology services that these apps rely on and there are like wide range of providers for each of these bits uh, and, and put together forms uh, the uh, digital lending ecosystem providers so to speak yeah. okay so 
And uh, Srikant, I think the overwhelming theme that we have seen uh, across this ecosystem, so in BSP, or whether it's an analytics provider or whether it's a cloud provider, whether, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's the core, we see that uh, most of it is sourced from China. And we also mm -hmm. see that uh, the, the money is probably also flowing in from China via individual investors, right? Right. Now, uh, I think uh, we, we, we really think that this is a fairly serious situation we are in as a country, and we, we need to take some bold steps to address this. So we think there are four areas of action at this point of time. Uh, one is to definitely raise awareness among individuals so they don't fall into this debt, debt trap. The second one would be to work with platforms like you know Google and Apple to make sure that these sort of uh, microfinance apps do not end up abusing users' trust or you know they do not abuse uh, personal identifiable information. Okay. And uh, we also need to make sure that you know the ads that pop up on platforms like Facebook or you know TikTok or YouTube. They do not exploit uh, the, this uh, this particular segment uh, of our population who need money but are probably not financially very aware. On the regulation side, uh, this is uh, this is a I would say this is one area where regulation definitely needs to pitch in. Uh, you know, we've had. Uh, a banking sector, a thriving banking sector for decades now, and yet, uh, you know, uh, the unbanked or, you know, financial inclusion has not been stellar. And the lack of financial uh, inclusion often leads to, you know, people without anywhere to go when they really need money to make ends meet. So this is not like people need money to you know to gamble, but these are people who probably need money to go see a doctor, or probably you know the rap cab driver who needs money to you know uh, get his uh, his cab repaired so that you know he can run it uh, the next day. So uh, we we really hope that you know uh, RBI is going to pitch in and you know take a stronger stance against these apps. And finally, we think law enforcement needs to do a lot more. We've seen some laudable efforts from uh, the police force in Hyderabad, in Chennai, but we, given the breadth of the operation, we think a nationwide approach would probably suit better. Srikant, your thoughts on this? Yeah, so on, on the enforcement, uh couple of things it's one is regulatory supervision by rbi on uh, how these actors get access to bank accounts uh, payment uh, processor systems and so on so that's that's one area where uh, there has to be stringent guidelines on say due diligence before uh, having gateway accounts and so on and the other uh, is when we still to see the end of this in the sense that there has been some action and investigation by the police which is laudable uh, but more often times uh, especially in the case in the context of cyber crime uh, there hasn't been a prosecution so somebody is not going into jail convicted uh, and that needs to kind of go up uh, to have uh, these frauds checked uh, so it should not be like uh, there is some police action that's happening and then it slowly fizzles out in the news and nobody gets arrested and things get back to normal. Uh, so, so that's one area again where uh, particularly in the context of cybercrime, uh, the prosecution of uh, these crimes needs to have uh, a better role as well. The thing that you know, uh, I forgot to add is that the fact that uh, personal data, including you know, 
Radha information or your you know, facial biometric information is being shipped off outside of India, that itself is a huge national security concern, right? Right. And, and the scale at okay. which uh, it, it goes, exactly. and, and we typically see uh, these entities proudly say that they have a database of like 100 million users and so on, which is like uh, roughly like 10% of, of, of the population and and having that kind of detailed uh, level of information uh, essentially kind of defeats uh, the purpose if you're trying to use again systems like Aadhaar because somebody else also has a copy of almost everything that's uh, there with these uh, sensitive systems. Right. So, so how did we go about uh, figuring out all this information? So we did two things. One, we built a set of tools ourselves and uh, we looked at and we used a few third party tools. Uh, I let Sikant shine in on the third party tools, but I'll just take a moment to explain uh, what sort of tools we have built. One, uh, we've built uh, scrapers to gather information on companies, especially the ones that uh, that have that are related to these apps. So we look at the app metadata on Play Store, we then cross reference it with application uh, we then basically uh, cross reference it with uh, publicly available metadata of corporates in india and we then also look up the directory information from that corporate data okay so that's one thing the other thing that we are doing is we are building our own tool to make it easy for anyone to look up uh, the network of these apps by uh, using indicators or artifacts that we think are interesting for example you know one indicator that we found very useful has been the email id that is registered against any company okay and uh, or for for that matter you know the name of our director so you know you you can uh, you should be able to look up uh, how many companies that an individual is linked to with uh, just one click essentially and I'll go on to that uh, in a second. Uh, Sri, uh, Sri do you want to just uh, go through the other tools that we've worked? Yeah, so the other tools include like Kudus, which is an Android, uh, iOS, mobile application, open source intelligence tool. So what they do is they analyze uh, almost pretty much every other app that's out there and provide the analysis for us to query based on a range of factors. So this is how we figured out uh, a bunch of apps you use the same uh, uh, facial recognition provider or a bunch of apps are hosted on alibaba cloud so you can actually do a search on uh, various of these parameters and then get a list of apps uh, and and can monitor these searches as well the other is mob sf uh, which is a open source mobile security framework which can uh, analyze any particular given app. So when, when we are short of intelligence from the standard analysis that's out there in Kudus, MobSF uh, reverses an entire app and then lets us uh, go into deep as to what all an app does and one could even get a, a approximately accurate reverse code. Uh, and then there is a Google Play API uh, that we use to dump all the data into the database that we have of all the apps. So which basically gives, given any uh, app, uh, it can fetch all the metadata involved, or it could even get a list of apps uh, on a particular uh, search uh, term and then populate the list of apps. And this is how we kind of built uh, the database of thousand apps. And we, we're still like using these uh, tools to kind of expand the database uh, yeah. All right. So what I'm going to do is probably give a sneak preview of the tool that we are working on. Hang on. So here it goes. It's very much a work in progress and, uh, you know, we hope to improve it in, over time. All right. So it's basically a web app and we've built it on top of view and 
it has a search basic search in interface and you should be able to you know import uh, let's say an email id and you know figure out if there are any matches okay and let me just check And while Suman checks that, uh, if you have questions, please type them on the Zoom Q and A or the YouTube chat. Uh, we'll have them answered now. Right. So yeah, you should be able to type in, you know, even a part of a name. And yeah, if you click on search, you'll get a host of uh, companies that you know that have that uh, string either in the email address or you know as the name of a director and you know then you can start uh, digging into each of these apps we also have an app uh, all right so we have listed almost all the apps that we have seen here and uh, we hope to add more metadata as and when we figure out stuff. And uh, we plan to share this with uh, everyone. We'll put it up on our website. Uh, we'll also make sure that the source code is available to everyone. Okay. And uh, okay, so we'll also provide a, a link for downloading the data. Okay. Right. I think that would uh, so for 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 the timing that would be all that we have to show, but uh, we'll keep posting as and when we improve this web app, and uh, you should be able to get it. Uh, you know, get the information from our Twitter feeds, and you know, you should be able to get the source from our GitHub repo. Okay. All right. So we're almost done. Anything else? Uh, All right, so yeah, Shrikant, you want to take the last slide? Hello. Hello. Yeah, uh, so while we wait for questions, uh, feel free to join us as we kind of build this uh, small little tech to kind of be a watchtower on top of these app ecosystems uh, so i'm Srikant. you can follow our work on cashless consumer on our website a blog or join our telegram channel uh, and chat with us you can reach to suman on uh, band reach uh, on twitter github and let me see if we have any questions Okay, so uh, Tarunima asks the graph on annual companies registrations, what sort of companies are you describing? So I think this is on the earlier slide, uh, Suman. Right, let's go back the... to the slide. Yeah, uh, hang on. Let's go back uh, to the slide. Uh, the, this one, right? Companies incorporated by year, right? Right, right. Right, okay. So, uh, okay, so the can you just repeat the question once? Uh, what sort of companies are you describing in the graph of company registration? Right, that's a good question, actually. So, the way we started doing this or building this. We started building this graph. Was we started with one company? Okay, we started with one uh, one or two companies that came up on Play Store app descriptions, and then uh, we we basically you know put it in a table and we listed or mapped out the directors for that particular company. Uh, for each individual director, we started looking at 
what other companies that director uh, that individual is a director of okay and then we listed uh, then we added those uh, companies to our original table and uh, those new new set of companies will have had uh, newer directors right and when then we started uh, following those directors and uh, we did this for a while uh, for about 200 uh, odd companies and then we started uh, automating it and then we ended up with around half a million companies okay uh, but i i mean what you're seeing here is basically a snapshot of the first 200 250 companies that we looked at okay and these are the ones that have come across that we have come across uh, both via that you know network traversal as well as ones that we have been able to cross reference uh, or validate with uh, you know with app descriptions or Uh, companies that have come up come up in news reports of arrests that police have made okay okay and uh, okay so next uh, question comes from raminder singh uh, he asks how can we enforce play stores like google uh, to have an indicator within play store to red mark few apps like there is no indicator if any app is banned by government but uh, already on my phone uh, and we are not getting any notification to uninstall or it's banned okay i think this uh, largely is about people who have already installed uh, one of these apps uh but then google play store removes these apps for whatever reason after the arrests or police writing in, in into them but the users who already download the app i don't think they are getting any notification to uninstall or that it's banned uh no this is a very good question actually and i think this is something that we need to uh push google into doing basically you know it's up to them if they're if they are going to remove an app they should inform existing users that you know this is the reason that they are removing an app yeah and uh the other question that he had is what is the road map for community contribution uh i am assuming he is asking about the stuff we are building or i don't know the question is very broad ended uh so if if that's the thing that uh, you're asking i think someone will kind of put up uh, when we have uh, sorted out some of the initial uh, things and then put it up on github and you could feel free to pitch in and uh, and improve the app and um he has another question is there a way to know these apps ads reach what's footprint like how many citizens getting their ads reached uh, like this may this might be huge to know their reach i think this is some way of measuring the reach of uh, uh, the ads that pop up for these uh, apps so is there a way to kind of measure the reach of these ads of these apps mm mm-hmm. it would be interesting definitely but uh, right now it's not something we've looked at and uh, we don't really have any data that we can point you to unfortunately but we'll keep this in mind right right um... i think ravi has an interesting uh, comment here uh, ravi said here he says that the google play store probably does notify users when they remove an app but probably not very sure on this so again you know this is something we could probably double check with google play store policy you know and basically you know uh, we'll we'll share whatever we learn and ideally the play protect should kind of uh come into this especially given that there is a law enforcement action over these apps right. so something like a play protect notification should go in i mean even if it's a side loaded app uh, i mean if you have, have play protect in your device that should alert you saying that you kind of have an app that's we've deemed uh, illegal because of a police action or something like that 
Yes, and, and I think there's another problem here. Uh, so Google Play Store is not the only place that people can install apps from, right? So we also need to keep in mind that there are third-party app stores or even websites of these companies where uh, you know the APKs are often hosted and people can simply download it from there and start using it, right? Right. All right. All right. Uh, so Siddharth Doshi Joshi asked for the database. Uh, is there a plan to have a public API to access this DB? I linked uh, him up to the uh, Play Store DB that we have, uh, but I'll leave it to you to answer for the director information and the company right. information. Yeah. Right. Uh, so we are definitely going to have all of this information packaged into a web app. Uh, I'm not really sure if it makes sense to open up an API because it takes a work, honestly speaking, to, you know, spin up an API. And uh, unless there's a lot of interest, we may not just be able to do that. But if you specifically want access please reach out to me. I'll be more than happy to share it with you personally. Okay. All right. And, uh... All right. And website should also have, so Raminder Singh has a suggestion that says website should have a few learning videos and also news clipping on frauds and that probably we could just link this video as well on the website. Uh, and that's a good suggestion on. Noted, on, yes. Uh, yeah. We should make some smaller videos on how to detect uh, these apps. All right, absolutely. Right, and I don't see any other comment. Uh, if there's not anything from else from your side uh so many. so not really i think uh uh you know i've covered most of what i wanted to and anyway we this is not this is just the beginning right and we are going to cover this in detail over the next two months and i'm hoping you read about it a lot more in news stories as well. And Srikanth has also been sharing information with TV journalists. So, you know, it'd be not just in print or online, it'll also be available to you on uh, national TV. So, so yeah, stay tuned. Over to you, Srikanth. Okay, and thank you for joining for this session. And I think that's all we have for today. And let's hope that this, uh, loan apps doesn't kill one more person anymore and with that we'll close the session thank you for joining thank you bye thank you everyone bye bye